Shino was a nobody, a plain awkward guy who met his end while heroically saving two girls from a dangerous attacker. But death wasn't the end for him. He woke up in a world filled with swords and magic, reborn as Kane, the third son of a wealthy noble family. Despite remembering his past life he quickly realized that he was far from ordinary in this new world. Here magic was a gift from the gods, ranging from levels 1 to 5 determined during a sacred baptism. As Cain's family brought him for the ceremony, a mysterious light burst forth from one of the statues. Suddenly Cain found himself standing before seven gods in a vast white space. They revealed that his previous death was a mistake but praised his selfless act, deciding to reincarnate him into this magical world. Grateful, Cain thanked them, joking about becoming a legendary wizard. The gods granted him their protection, assuring they'd watch over him, and he disappeared, returning Cain to the church. Back in the church, the priest and Cain's family were puzzled by the strange light. Cain, however, knew it was the gods' doing. When his father asked him to reveal his status, Cain hesitated. He suspected that the sly priest might have tampered with his baptism, so he quickly left the room to check his stats in private. As he feared, his magic and divine protections were maxed out at level 10, far exceeding the normal level 5. To avoid unwanted attention, he used a concealment spell to hide his overpowered abilities. Later that evening during dinner, Kane's father asked him to reveal his status again. The room fell silent as everyone saw that Kane had received protection from all the gods. His father immediately warned him to keep this a secret, fearing that the kingdom might see him as a threat and put him under strict surveillance. After dinner Kane returned to his room, where he found a summoning book on his bed. Curious he attempted to summon a small, adorable creature, but instead, a dangerous monster appeared, ready to attack two nearby girls. Kane quickly stepped between the monster and the girls, urging them to escape while he fought back with fire magic. Though the creature dodged his attacks and landed a blow on Kane, he was determined to succeed this time. With a final effort he managed to banish the monster, collapsing afterward. The girls rushed to his side and as Cain lay there he couldn't help but think about how much he wanted to touch their cat-like ears. After realizing he wasn't going to die, he apologized for scaring them. They hugged him, and in that moment, Cain resolved to dedicate his life to helping others. The next day Cain's father introduced him to the guests who had gathered to celebrate his birthday and asked what he wanted to do with his life. Cain declared his desire to travel and help others, setting his sights on becoming an adventurer. His father informed him during breakfast the following morning that they had arranged a tutor to prepare him for his new life. Cain eagerly ran to the window to catch a glimpse of his tutor, using his enhanced abilities to get closer. However he miscalculated, landing on the edge of the building and falling. Fortunately the people below cushioned his fall, but not before he accidentally landed in an embarrassing position with one of the girls. After apologizing profusely the butler introduced Cain to his tutors, Millie and Nina. They would be training him for the next three years. When they reached the training ground, Millie asked Kane to demonstrate his swordsmanship. Both tutors were impressed by his skill. Millie then challenged him to a sparring match, surprised to find him keeping pace with her, despite his young age. When they realized he had the protection of the god of war, Millie decided to hand over the magic lessons to Nina while she took a break. Kane, however, had already mastered several spells from books, and when he demonstrated his abilities, the girls were astonished. Even high-ranking mages couldn't match Kane's skill. As they discussed his talent, Kane pulled a towel from a magical item box, further shocking his tutors, who realized he had multiple divine protections. Kane then asked if they could train outside the family property, and the girls agreed, seeking permission from his parents. His parents, amused by Kane's progress, allowed it on the condition that they return by sundown and avoid trouble. Once outside, the tutors instructed Kane to practice intermediate-level magic but his power was so immense that it created a crater in the ground. Firewolf! <gasps> no! <laughs> Millie and Nina were forced to admit that Kane's abilities were beyond their level. Concerned for his well-being they asked if he was okay but Kane reassured them he was fine, confirming their suspicions that he was extraordinarily powerful. Just then, a deadly rabbit emerged from the bushes and attacked. Millie missed her strike. But Kane quickly dispatched the creature using air bullets. Impressed, the girls asked what he planned to do with the remains, and Kane decided to show them to his mother and sister. As he stored the rabbit in his item box, the girls watched in awe, realizing just how special Kane was. They spent the rest of the day hunting monsters. Millie used her search ability to locate the monsters closest to them. 
Kane was amazed at how Millie could sense monsters so easily. She explained that it was simple she spread her magic like a thin veil around her, searching for the magical signatures of nearby creatures. Following her guidance Kane tried it out, and to his delight, managed to locate even more monsters than Millie had. Together they hunted down the deadly rabbits, but when Kane began chasing one towards the forest, the girls quickly stopped him. Puzzled, Kane asked why he couldn't go into the forest, and Millie explained that it was home to powerful monsters. Millie went on to say that every ten years, the monsters from the forest would try to attack the city which is why the walls and gates were fortified. Only the strongest adventurers could fend off such threats, she said, encouraging Kane to strive to become one of them someday. That night Kane checked his status and found that he had leveled up after defeating the deadly rabbits. But instead of feeling excited he worried that if anyone discovered his true strength, he could be seen as a threat, and even face execution. The next day, Millie and Nina took Kane to the Adventurer's Guild to gather information on monsters they could hunt together. At the guild Rudy, the receptionist, informed them about a pack of wolves spotted near the city. When she noticed Kane she asked who he was, and Nina mentioned that he was the son of the Domain Lord, prompting Rudy to address him formally. As Kane was thanking her for the information, an arrogant adventurer interrupted them. He was a C rank and believed he was superior to Millie and Nina, who were D ranks. He rudely demanded that they fetch him a drink, but Millie told him to go to a bar if he was that thirsty, and Nina pointed out that they were on duty and couldn't waste time on his nonsense. Angered by their refusal, the adventurer grabbed Nina, while his lackeys grabbed Millie. Kane quickly intervened, politely enters asking the man to release his tutors, as they were busy training him. The girls urged Kane to run, but he stood his ground, knocking the adventurer's hand away from Nina, furious. The man tried to fight Kane, but the five-year-old easily overpowered him, embarrassing him in front of everyone. In a desperate attempt to save face, the adventurer drew his sword, but Kane effortlessly dodged his attacks, eventually throwing him out of the guild. He then dealt with the men holding Millie, freeing her as well. Grateful Nina hugged Kane and thanked him for protecting them. Millie praised his fighting skills, and Kane modestly admitted that he had learned from watching too many action movies. Afterward they headed to the forest to continue Kane's training, and he enjoyed every moment of it. Three years later Sylvia informed Kane that Millie and Nina wouldn't be renewing their contract. She offered to speak with Kane's father to convince them to stay, but Kane declined, not wanting to hold them back. Instead, he decided to give them a parting gift. Remembering that Millie had always wanted a magic bag, he teleported to the forest, where he took down a blood ogre and an earth dragon to use their materials for crafting the bags. However, his powerful attacks were mistaken by the city guards for a monster outbreak. They quickly alerted Garm, who rushed to the forest with his soldiers. By the time they arrived, Kane had already teleported back home but had accidentally dropped his handkerchief. The guards found no monsters, just a massive crater, and Garm was left wondering what could have caused such destruction until he found Kane's handkerchief and realized his son was the monster. The next day, after hunting some wolves and storing their remains in his item box, Kane presented the magic bags he had made to Millie and Nina. Millie pointed out that even a full party of a rank adventurers would struggle against such monsters, but Kane had defeated them with ease. Kane downplayed the feat, explaining that the bags could hold items as large as his family mansion. The girls were astonished and warned that such bags would make them targets for thieves. But Kane reassured them, saying that the bags would empty themselves if anyone else tried to use them. He then thanked them for being his tutors, but before he could finish, both girls kissed him on the cheek. They told him to call on them if he ever needed help. Two years later Kane and his family headed to the royal capital for his debut in society, as he had just turned ten. While traveling in the carriage Kane sensed a battle ahead between humans and monsters. He informed his father, who quickly ordered the soldiers to go and assist. Kane, however, knew that by the time they arrived, the battle would be over. He told his family he was going to help and jumped out of the moving carriage, using wind magic to speed ahead. As he passed the soldiers they only felt a gust of wind and wondered if a train had just rushed by. Garm could only gape in amazement. Soon Kane reached the scene, where a group of monstrous creatures was attacking an injured soldier. Kane swiftly cut them down, but when he approached the soldier, the man took a defensive stance, unsure if Kane was a friend or foe. Kane sheathed his sword and introduced himself, but the man remained wary until Garm's soldiers arrived and recognized Kane. Realizing Kane was not a threat, the man collapsed, and Kane used his magic to heal him and his comrades. 
Sadly some of the soldiers had already died so Kane gathered their bodies into his item box. Moments later Garm and the rest of the family arrived, surprised to find all the monsters already defeated. One of the soldiers promised to explain what had happened. Just then, Garm noticed the crest on the side of the carriage they had been protecting it belonged to Duke Santana's house. Kane used a spell called Relax which sent the girls into a blissful state, as if they were floating on a cloud. They felt so euphoric that it was almost as if Kane had cast a love spell on them. Suddenly they were competing for his attention, tugging on his arms like he was a lifeless ragdoll. Curious about where he was headed, they asked him, and when Kane mentioned that he was on his way to the royal capital, they were delighted they were going there too. Without giving him a chance to decline, they decided that he would travel with them for the rest of the journey, pulling him into their carriage. During the ride Kane felt incredibly uncomfortable as the girls sat close to him, not allowing him to switch seats. He tried to tell them they were acting like his clingy ex, but they just laughed it off, insisting on sticking to him like glue. They even demanded that he address them as if they were old friends. Just then a soldier informed them that they would be arriving at a rest stop soon, and Kane wished the earth would swallow him whole, knowing the man had overheard their conversation. When the carriage stopped, Kane tried to excuse himself saying he would see them the next day, but the girls insisted that he stay with them. Arm, Kane's father, told the girls that it wasn't appropriate for a young man to spend the night with two young ladies, but they argued that they needed him to protect them in case of another attack. Left with no choice, Kane reluctantly agreed. Garm, in a teasing tone, warned Kane to behave, saying he wasn't ready to become a grandfather yet. Later that night in their room the girls convinced Kane to take the bed in the middle. Then, they pushed their beds closer to his and laid down on either side of him. Kane pointed out that this was improper, but the girls insisted that being close to him was the only way they felt safe. Kane eventually agreed to let them sleep beside him, but by morning he hadn't slept a wink. Days later when they finally arrived at the royal capital, the girls introduced Kane to the vice-captain of the Order of the Chiar, Dame Von Gazard. Dame thanked Kane for protecting the girls, and for bringing back his fallen comrades. Kane asked him to inform their families that the soldiers had fought bravely, and were now resting with the gods in Valhalla. As the bell rang, signaling the end of their conversation, Kane prepared to leave, but Dame stopped him, informing him that he was to have an audience with the king, which took Kane by surprise. In the throne room, many nobles had gathered to see the young man who had single-handedly saved the princess and the duke's daughter. After Kane bowed before the king, the king announced that Kane would be made a baron and rewarded with ten platinum coins, and a mansion for his heroism. The nobles were stunned, but one particularly unpleasant noble named Gaston had the audacity to protest, calling it foolish to grant such a title to a boy so young. The king however shut him down, pointing out that Cain had accomplished something far beyond what a coward like Gaston could ever do, and his decision was final. Cain accepted his new title, and as the king declared the audience over, he asked Cain to meet him in the parlor. Cain and Garm waited together until the king arrived with Princess Testa and Duke Santana. To Cain's surprise both the king and the duke thanked him for saving the girls. When they were seated, Garm asked why the king had made Cain a baron. The king explained that Cain was an exceptionally skilled swordsman and magician, and rewarding him was the right thing to do. The king then revealed the real reason he had asked to see Cain he wanted Cain to marry his daughter, Princess Testa. Duke Santana added that he also wished for Cain to marry his daughter, Miss Silk. Cain was shocked. But they reassured him that the marriages wouldn't be official until he was older. When he tried to refuse, they reminded him that he had held hands with both girls and even spent the night with them, which, in their eyes, was as good as a betrothal. Kane looked to his father for help, but Garm suddenly found the ceiling very interesting. With no way out, Kane reluctantly accepted their offer, becoming engaged to two young ladies at the tender age of ten. The next day Kane went to the church to pray and was transported to the void, where the gods awaited him. Kane told them that he wanted to discuss his overwhelming powers. The god of creation asked if Kane wished to become a demigod, explaining that Cain was on the same level as holy beasts and divine dragons but warned that there were limits to what he could achieve alone. He advised Cain to be careful with his choices and urged him to use his knowledge from his previous life to create something entertaining. Later that day Cain accompanied his mother and sister to a dress shop, but after a while he couldn't stand being cooped up inside any longer and went outside for some fresh air. There, he noticed Parma, an old friend, standing in front of a shop across the street. He went over to say hello and Parma was delighted to see him. She asked what had brought him to the capital, and Kane explained that he was there to make his debut in society. 
He then asked if she was out shopping as well, but Parma told him that she was working as an apprentice for her uncle, who soon came out of the shop. Tamas, the uncle, initially thought Kane was just another friend of Parma's until she mentioned that Kane was the son of a noble. Tamas immediately apologized for his rudeness, but Kane assured him it was fine and asked for permission to look around the shop. After browsing Kane told Tamas that he wanted him to produce a game. When Tamas asked what kind of game, Kane showed him a board game called Reversi. Impressed, Tamas agreed to create a prototype, and Kane handed him a gold coin to cover the expenses. Tamas tried to refuse the money but Kane insisted, calling it an investment. Just as Kane was leaving the shop he saw a fuming Rini waiting by the carriage. She scolded him for leaving in the middle of her fitting, but Kane smoothed things over by telling her he knew she looked great in the dress. Satisfied with his compliment, Rini promised to model the dress for him when it was delivered. A few days later, while Rini was putting on her one-woman fashion show, Sylvia came to inform Kane that Tamas had requested his presence at the shop. When Kane arrived, Tamas presented the reversi prototype and Kane was pleased with it. As he demonstrated the game to Parma, Kane told Tamas that he wanted to mass-produce it. He suggested creating a regular version for commoners, and a more luxurious one for nobles. However, Tamas explained that he couldn't start mass production just yet due to a lack of funds. Kane reassured him, offering a few more gold coins as another investment. Manus explained that they would need to create a contract and present it to the god of commerce, after which they would both swear to uphold their ends of the deal. By doing this they would secure exclusive rights to produce the game for the next three years. After sealing the agreement, Kane asked Tamas to create another extravagant version of the game as a gift for the royal family, which took Tamas by surprise. The next day Kane and his family headed to the palace for the debut ball. While they were in the carriage, Garm warned Kane to be cautious of matchmaking mothers who would be eager to pair their daughters with a rich young man like him. When they arrived at the ball, Garm and Kane met Duke Santana and Silk, who thanked Kane again for saving her life. Kane couldn't help but compliment how stunning she looked in her ball gown, though his words came out a bit too smoothly, prompting the Duke to ask him to tone it down. Walking away with his father, Kane apologized for speaking to Silk like that, admitting it was an unconscious habit he had developed. Just then the royal family arrived, and after the king addressed the crowd each family took turns greeting him. When it was Kane's turn he greeted the king and complimented Princess Testia by calling her a goddess. The king, amused, warned him to keep his charming words away from his daughter. Kane then presented the king with the reverse game he had created. Impressed, the king invited Kane to see him in his private parlor after the event. After leaving the king's side, Garm suggested that Kane mingle with the other children while he and Sarah greeted some of their friends. However, before Kane could do as his father asked, Silk approached him with drinks and invited him to chat. As they were talking, an unattractive, arrogant boy approached them with his equally unpleasant friends. The boy, clearly expecting Silk to be impressed by him, was surprised when she spoke to him with the coldness of a snow queen. One of his friends then accused Kane of disrespecting the boy, revealing him as the eldest son of Marquis Carino. This only confirmed Kane's suspicion that the boy was the son of his sworn enemy. Hoping to avoid further trouble, Kane introduced himself to the group, but the boys misunderstood his title and complained that he hadn't spoken to them with enough respect. Silk tried to intervene, but Kane stopped her and demanded that the boy apologize for speaking rudely in her presence. Feeling insulted, the boy challenged Kane to a duel outside. In the courtyard the boy boasted that his friends had been blessed with magic, but when the first one tried to show off his magic, he only managed to produce a weak fireball. The second one attempted the same, creating small stone bullets that Kane easily dodged. Tired of their pathetic attempts, Silk stepped in and revealed that Kane wasn't just the son of a baron but was a baron himself. The boys, realizing that Kane was the one the king had recently bestowed the title upon, quickly apologized and ran off with their tails between their legs. After they left, Silk teased Kane, saying she couldn't wait to tell Testia what had happened. Kane begged her to keep it a secret, and she agreed on the condition that he take her on a date. Just then, Testia arrived and asked what they were talking about. Silk was about to spill the beans, but Kane quickly covered her mouth. Shocked, Testia scolded Kane, saying it was scandalous to touch an unmarried maiden, so he let go. Silk then told Testia that they were talking about the date Kane was going to take her on. Testia pouted, feeling left out, so Kane promised to take her on a separate date. Testia was so delighted that, when her father suddenly appeared behind her, she eagerly told him about it. The king calmly informed Kane that their talk later wouldn't just be about the game but also about his precious daughter. 
A few days later the king's advisor presented Cain with the key to his new mansion, apologizing for the king's absence. Cain was pleased as this meant he wouldn't have to spend hours playing reversi with the king. However, Duke Santana arrived just then and insisted on playing a few rounds with Cain. As they played more nobles appeared out of nowhere, each demanding a turn. After leaving the palace, Cain made his way to his new mansion, but was shocked to find it was a rundown dump. Walking through the house, Cain decided to salvage the situation by using magic to repair and clean the place. Satisfied with his work, he laid on his freshly made bed, reflecting on how well his life had been going so far. Just then, Sylvia called out to him, and Cain hurried downstairs to meet her. She introduced the new maids and butler to him, and after the introductions Sylvia instructed the maids to clean the house. When they couldn't find a speck of dirt, Cain admitted he had used magic to clean up. Sylvia, unbothered, left to collect his belongings, while Colin, the new butler, advised Cain to return to his parents' mansion since his elder brothers were coming home that day. Later at his parents' house Cain's brothers congratulated him on becoming a baron at such a young age. When Rene mentioned she couldn't wait to see his new house, her brothers teased that they had heard it was haunted. Rene, however, confidently said she wasn't worried because she knew Cain would protect her. A while later, Cain took his parents and sister to see his house, and his father was astonished to see that it was no longer the rundown mess it had been. Cain admitted that he had used magic to fix the place up, then gave them a tour. When they reached the garden, Garm remarked that the house was spectacular but suggested it needed some artwork and perhaps a few mounted monsters. Just then, a loud scream echoed from the corridor. Rushing to check it out, Cain found his servants cowering in fear at the sight of a mounted red dragon in the foyer. Arm, astonished asked why Cain had a mounted red dragon. Cain casually explained that he had defeated it some time ago. Garm was in utter disbelief a red dragon was a Calamity-class monster that usually required at least five ranked adventurers to defeat, yet his son had done it alone. Despite his shock, Garm admitted it was an impressive piece to own, noting that buying such a trophy would have cost a fortune. After Kane tried to figure out how much a red dragon would cost in Japanese yen, he suddenly heard his sister scream. He and his family rushed to see what happened, and his mother asked where he got a toilet that shoots water. Garm didn't understand why they were making a big deal over a toilet, but after trying it himself, he agreed it was a great invention. He mentioned that any guests Kane invited would probably enjoy it too, but Kane was confused about why he'd invite anyone over. Garm explained that it was traditional to throw a housewarming party when moving into a new home, which took Kane by surprise. That night, Colin presented Kane with a list of high ranking nobles he should invite to the party. Kane wasn't thrilled to see that Marcus Carino was on the list but Colin insisted he had to be invited. Kane also noticed the king wasn't on the list, so Colin explained that only the highest-ranking nobles could invite the king. Kane then focused on what gifts to prepare for these snobbish nobles. Sylvia suggested he follow his own instincts, so Kane decided to use his magic to create elegant wine glasses as gifts. He also asked the chef to make hamburger steaks and had Sylvia taste them. After one bite Sylvia felt like she was in heaven, and the sparkling wine made her even more convinced that she was experiencing pure bliss. Just then, Colin came in to tell Cain that the king had requested his presence at the castle. When Cain arrived, the king jokingly complained about not receiving an invitation to the party yet, especially since Duke Santana was already bragging about his. Cain apologized and explained that he was waiting for the perfect moment to give him the invitation. As soon as he handed it over the king's face lit up with joy, and he eagerly showed it off to the duke. The king then confirmed he would attend the party with Testia and mentioned he was really looking forward to it. That evening Cain informed his servants that the king would be attending the party, which surprised them all. He also revealed that Testia was his fiancée and asked everyone to make sure the event went smoothly. On the night of the party Cain welcomed his guests and made a toast using the new wine glasses he had created. His parents and the duke were amazed by the quality of the wine. Soon after the king arrived with his family. After tasting the wine and steak he was overjoyed. Then the queen approached Cain to ask about the toilet, so the king went to try it out himself. When he came back he was so impressed that he asked Cain to install one in the palace, praising the party for offering the ultimate hospitality, which led to applause from the guests. As the party continued, Colin informed Cain that Carino had arrived. Cain held Colin back from warning Carino about the mounted red dragon in the foyer, hoping to get a little revenge. When Carino saw the dragon he screamed in terror and nearly fainted, but Cain assured him it was already dead. Carino, oblivious to the disdain from the other nobles sat down to enjoy the party. 
Although he knew the wine was excellent, he refused to admit it. Kane offered him some steak, which Carino ate greedily, even demanding more sauce. At that point Kane was ready to kick him out, but Colin reminded him that Carino was still a high-ranking noble. When Kane offered him some wine glasses, Carino greedily requested all the glasses, the wine and even the steak recipe. Kane refused, saying the glasses were gifts for everyone. Carino kept pushing, so Kane told him he had something better for him, which piqued Carino's interest. Just then the king appeared, causing Carino to fall to his knees in fear. The king scolded him for his poor behavior and Carino quickly apologized and left in shame. Silk then approached Kane, saying she knew he had set Carino up. Kane admitted it was the only way to get rid of him. But the king overheard and asked if Kane had used him to chase Carino away. Kane was worried he was in trouble, but Silk and the Duke just laughed at his situation. The following week, Kane visited the royal training ground to meet up with Dame, as the king had arranged for him to have a storage space for some raw materials. When Dame showed him the room, Kane mentioned that it was too small for the large monster materials he needed to store. Dame was surprised and asked if it was anything like the red dragon Kane had at home. Kane said it wasn't, revealing it was actually an earth dragon, nearly causing Dame to faint from shock. After confirming it was indeed an earth dragon, Dame told Kane to leave it in the courtyard, where the knights would handle it later. Kane thanked him and then emptied his item box, revealing not just an earth dragon but several other powerful monsters as well. Dame was in disbelief that a child could take down so many strong creatures, so he asked if Kane was a hero or blessed by the gods. Kane, feeling awkward, assured him he was just an ordinary person, and asked where the items would be stored later. As he was about to leave, Dame stopped him and invited him to join the knights for training. He wanted to introduce Kane to their captain and show off his skills, so Kane agreed. When the knights gathered, Dame introduced Kane, who would be training with them for the day. One night, Captain Obvious remarked that Kane was just a kid. Dame replied that if he was brave enough to get beaten by a kid, he could spar with Kane first. The knight agreed, but Kane quickly defeated him, leaving the knight embarrassed and ashamed. Kane then tried to leave, but Dame insisted he take on the rest of the knights all at once. Just as they were about to attack, someone called out for them to stop, and when Kane looked up, he saw a green haired elf. As soon as the elf landed on the training ground, she rushed over to Kane and pulled him into a protective hug, scolding the knights for ganging up on a helpless child. But Dame quickly corrected her, explaining that Kane was the one who had single-handedly taken down the 30 orcs that tried to attack Princess Testia and Silk. The moment those words left his mouth, a wild grin spread across the elf's face. Without hesitation she challenged Kane to a duel. Kane tried to get out of it by claiming he didn't have a weapon, but she simply sheathed her sword and told him to come at her. With no other choice, Kane reluctantly agreed. The knights watched in amazement as Kane matched their captain blow for blow. The duel continued for a few more seconds until Kane vanished, reappearing just in time to catch her off guard and claim victory. The captain was so impressed that she loudly declared that Kane would be her husband, shocking everyone. Kane immediately refused, insisting that he didn't even know who she was. The elf then introduced herself as Tiguna, an honorary viscount and the daughter of a duke. Still, Kane turned her down, mentioning that he wasn't interested in older women. Taguna just laughed and reminded him that, as an elf, she had a lifespan of about 300 years. Panicked, Kane ran to hide behind Dame, reasoning that, as a duke's daughter, Taguna couldn't choose her own husband. But she confidently told him she had promised her father she would return home with a suitable match. Kane looked to Dame for help, but the vice captain seemed to have fallen asleep. Taguna, undeterred, declared she would seek the king's approval immediately. She ordered Dame to bring Kane along as they marched toward the castle. In the king's parlor, the king looked puzzled and asked why Kane had come to see him. Taguna proudly announced that she had decided to marry Kane. The news stunned everyone, including the king, who asked how this had happened. Kane explained that he had defeated Taguna in a duel, and ever since then she had been following him around, completely smitten. Arm, shocked asked Kane if he knew anything about Taguna. When Kane admitted he didn't, the king revealed that she was actually a princess. He explained that before the formation of their kingdom, elves had been enslaved, but when the first king established the Esort kingdom, he integrated the elven lands to protect them, making Taguna a princess by birthright. The king then informed Taguna that Kane was already engaged to Testia and Silk, hoping to dissuade her. However, instead of backing down, Taguna declared that this only made her want Kane even more. Desperate to save Kane from this situation, the king told Taguna that he would consider her proposal only if her father approved. 
Confident, Taguna assured him that her father would agree, and then dragged Kane along as if he were her luggage. After Taguna left the king turned to Garm, bewildered and asked how someone like Kane could defeat the kingdom's strongest knight. Garm, equally puzzled, confessed that he had no idea. Dame, still in the room mentioned that when he had asked Kane if he was a disciple of the gods, Kane had acted strangely. This raised the king's suspicions, and he decided they needed to test Kane's abilities. A few days later Dame found Kane looking exhausted. Before Kane could flee, Dame reassured him that Taguna wasn't around and asked what had been going on. Kane explained that Taguna had been relentlessly challenging him to duels, leaving him utterly drained. Dame admitted that Taguna could be intense but pointed out that Kane's presence had actually helped her improve. Just as they were talking, Taguna's voice echoed nearby, and Kane tried to escape. But Dame caught him and informed him that the king wanted to see him, leaving Kane confused. Dame escorted Kane to the king's parlor, where the king, Garm, the duke, and the royal advisor were all waiting. Kane nervously asked why they had summoned him. The royal advisor handed him a book, claiming it contained top-level spells written by the first king. Kane's eyes lit up with excitement as he flipped through the pages, recognizing the high-level spells within. However, his excitement wasn't shared by the others. The king pointed out that Kane was the only one who could read the book, confusing Kane until he realized the text was written in Japanese. The king then asked who Kane really was. Deciding to come clean, Kane explained that he had memories from a previous life in Japan, the same place the first king had come from. Garm, in disbelief, asked if Kane was truly his son, and Kane assured him that during his baptism, the gods had confirmed it, which surprised everyone. Seeing their shocked faces, Kane revealed that he regularly spoke to the gods whenever he visited the church. The king then requested to see Kane's status, and Kane willingly showed it to them. After reviewing it, the king told Kane that he was destined to rule the kingdom, but Kane begged him to treat him as he always had. He admitted that he had been confused when he was first reincarnated, but with the support of his family and friends, he had come to appreciate the opportunities in his new life. Touched by his sincerity, the king promised to keep his secret but joked about making Kane the king, which led to some light-hearted complaints from the others. Suddenly, Taguna burst into the room, waving a letter from her father approving her marriage to Kane. Before anyone could stop her, she grabbed Kane and dragged him out of the room. After they left, the king made everyone swear to take Kane's secret to the grave. Two years later Kane was in the library, reading the book written by the first king. He had learned that the king had been transported to this world by truck, and had arrived in his original body. Before he could read further, Silk and Testia joined him, asking if he was studying for the academy entrance exams. Kane told them he was, and they offered to study together but he declined. When they asked if he'd study with them the next day he claimed to have plans and quickly left the library. Thinking he had successfully escaped, Kane bumped into Taguna, who immediately invited him to another duel. Kane told her he had something else to do, and when she asked about the next day he again claimed to be busy before running off. When he finally arrived home he quickly changed into his adventurer's clothes, eager to sign up at the guild now that he had finally turned 12. After arriving at the guild, Kane accidentally bumped into a red-haired man with a scar on his face. The man asked what Kane was doing there. Kane explained that he was there to join the guild, and the man wished him luck before walking away. Kane couldn't shake the feeling that he had seen the man somewhere before. But he pushed the thought aside and approached the reception desk. He informed the receptionist that he wanted to sign up for the guild. The receptionist, a young woman, handed him a form to fill out. Once he completed the form, she instructed him to place a drop of his blood on a crystal, explaining that it would record his abilities on his guild card. She added that, as a newcomer he would start at the lowest rank. Kane thanked her for her help, calling her Ma Am but she quickly corrected him, introducing herself as Risha. Just then, a group of unruly adventurers approached the desk, asking Risha to join them for a drink. When they noticed Kane standing nearby, their leader attempted to strike him, but Kane moved so swiftly that the man fell to the ground. Enraged, the man tried to attack again, but Kane effortlessly dodged him. The man's two companions also lunged at Kane, but they too were easily defeated. Just as the leader was about to draw his sword, the red-haired man from earlier intervened. Recognizing him as Claude of the Ice Flame, the leader immediately dropped his weapon and fled. Kane thanked Claude for stepping in, but Claude admitted he only did it to save the men from Kane. Intrigued, Kane introduced himself and Claude invited him to join him for a drink. While they were drinking, Claude asked Kane where he had learned to move like that. Kane explained that he had been taught by various tutors growing up, 
which led Claude to assume Kane was a spoiled rich kid. Kane then asked about Claude's title, Ice Flame. Claude explained that it was the name of his adventurer party, noting that his sword was a flaming one while his wife wielded ice magic, so the name seemed fitting. Claude also told Kane that if he found a trustworthy party, he could undertake more challenging quests that would help him rise in the ranks. When Claude showed Kane his own guild card, Kane noticed it was golden, indicating that Claude was in a ranked adventurer. Kane found this impressive, but Claude shrugged it off, saying he wouldn't consider himself truly skilled until he reached an SSS rank like the first king. At that moment someone struck Claude on the head. When he turned around he saw his wife Lena standing there. She scolded him for wasting time drinking when they had a quest to complete. However when Claude introduced her to Kane, Lena was polite. Just as Claude was praising Kane's abilities, Lena grabbed him by the ears and dragged him out of the guild. Left alone Kane decided to look for a quest to undertake. He quickly realized that the lowest ranked quests were menial tasks, but then he noticed a D-ranked quest to defeat some goblins. Deciding to take it he was about to leave the guild when he ran into Taguna. Kane couldn't tell if their encounter was by chance, or if she was stalking him. Dame was also there and explained that the knights were training outside the castle, which was why they were in the city. Kane informed them that he had just joined the guild and was heading out on a quest, but Taguna insisted on coming with him. Dame reminded her that she had training to oversee, but Taguna dismissed him, saying he shouldn't interfere with her love life, especially since he was destined to die single. She then grabbed Kane, who was trying to sneak away, and headed into the forest to assist with the quest. As they walked through the forest, Tiguna acted as if they were on a romantic date, behaving like a love-struck fool. But when Kane sensed goblins nearby and told her to focus, she dashed ahead of him, challenging him to catch her. When they arrived at the site they found a wrecked wagon and saw that an injured man was about to be attacked by goblins. They quickly intervened, with Kane healing the man while Tiguna fought off the goblins. As the number of goblins increased, Kane cast a protection spell on Taguna to keep her safe. After Taguna had finished off the last of the goblins, she began daydreaming about their wedding until they heard a loud noise. Looking in the direction of the sound, they saw giant green lizards approaching. Kane ordered Taguna to take the injured man and go while he dealt with the lizards. Taguna reluctantly agreed, but hadn't gone far when she saw the massive ice pillars Kane had used to defeat the lizards. Later at the guild, Kane told Risha that he had defeated some green lizards. She remarked that he was lucky to have escaped unharmed, but when he mentioned there had been 30 of them, Risha gasped and ran to inform the guild chief. The chief summoned Kane, introducing himself as Cedric. Skeptical, Cedric asked how Kane had managed to defeat 30 green lizards on his own. Kane assured him that he had done it, but Cedric didn't believe him and accused him of trying to swindle the guild. Cedric then declared that he was revoking Kane's guild card and ordered him to leave. Risha tried to argue that it was unfair, but Cedric shouted at her to be quiet or risk losing her job. Just when Kane thought his life as an adventurer was over, the guildmaster entered the room and asked what was going on. Cedric quickly told the guildmaster that Kane had cheated and was trying to scam the guild. The guildmaster asked Cedric if he had any proof, but Cedric could only say that it was obvious Kane couldn't have done it. The guildmaster then called for someone to enter, and when the door opened, Taguna walked in. Spotting Kane, she immediately jumped on him, calling him her husband, which made Kane remind her that their engagement was supposed to be a secret. Risha and Cedric were stunned, but after the guildmaster revealed that Kane was a baron and Taguna's future brother-in-law, Cedric began begging for forgiveness, realizing he had made a huge mistake. After assuring Cedric that all was forgiven, Kane asked if the guild would take the green lizards off his hands. The guildmaster agreed and ordered Risha and Cedric to handle everything. He then told Kane that he would be promoted to C rank. However, Taguna argued that Kane deserved to be ranked S since he had defeated a red dragon at the age of 10. The guildmaster conceded. As Risha and Cedric left the room, Taguna thanked Kane for putting up with her crazy brother. Meanwhile, the gods were watching Kane and noted that he had become stronger, which they feared might become a problem. Zenim, on the other hand, argued that Kane needed to grow stronger because he was destined to fight Eren, whose seal was about to break. The other gods were shocked by this revelation and agreed that if Eren were to be freed the world would be in danger. Zenim assured them not to worry, as he had the perfect mentor to teach Kane everything he needed to defeat Eren. Days later, Sylvia came to wake Kane up, reminding him that he had an exam to take. Realizing he was running late, Kane rushed out, apologizing for oversleeping. After stepping outside Kane used a teleportation spell to reach the academy. 
Once there he checked in for the exam and was directed to the exam hall. When he arrived and didn't spot Tessa or Silk, he wondered if they were taking the exam in a different hall. Soon after the examiner arrived and warned everyone against cheating. The exam started, and once it was over, they were informed that the next part would involve assessing their magical abilities, which got Kane excited. They headed out to the courtyard, where the examiner instructed them to use their most powerful spell against a target. Kane wondered if it was safe to go all out, but the examiner reassured him that the area was protected by a strong barrier, so he could use his full power. As Kane watched the other students struggle, he realized how much stronger he was compared to them, so he decided to change the spell he originally planned to use. When it was finally his turn, Kane created a fireball that turned blue and shot it as a fire bullet spell. The spell caused a massive explosion, blasting through the wall, and causing significant damage to the surroundings. Kane was surprised as he had only used a beginner-level spell. The stunned examiner quickly ensured that no one was harmed by the blast before announcing that the next category would be swordsmanship. The students then moved to another courtyard, where the examiner introduced them to some experienced adventurers who would help assess their swordsmanship. Claude, one of the adventurers, chose Kane as his opponent. As they exchanged blows at incredible speed, the other students were amazed, while Claude was impressed by Kane's ability to keep up with him. Their fight was eventually interrupted by the examiner, who asked them to stop as they were scaring the other students. Before leaving, Claude invited Kane to join him on an adventure sometime in the future. The examiner then told Kane to go home and wait for the final results. The following day at the palace, Kane was summoned by the king, who questioned him about the damage he had caused during the exams. After Kane explained what had happened, the king informed him that he had taken the exams in the commoner section by mistake. Later while checking the results Kane ran into Silk, who congratulated him for coming in first. Shortly after he met Renee who told him that, as the top student, he would be expected to give a speech at the entrance ceremony the next day. At the ceremony, after Kane delivered his speech, the king came out to congratulate him and the other students. In class the teacher asked them to choose a course of study before lectures began. Kane decided that adventuring was the way forward, but Silk and Tessa scolded him reminding him that he was a noble with other responsibilities. After class, Kane noticed some bullies picking on a girl. When he saw the girl's ears he realized it was Parma, so he stepped in to help her. While Tessa and Silk talked to Parma, Kane heard a voice in his head urging him to visit the library. Curious, he went to check it out and as he opened the library door, he was hit and teleported to a mysterious place. Kane found himself in an unfamiliar location, with a cottage before him. He entered, and was surprised to find a man making coffee inside. What shocked him even more was that the man seemed to know that Kane had been reincarnated into this world. When Kane asked how he knew, the man revealed that Zenim had told him everything. The man then introduced himself as Hol Yuya, which made Kane realize that he was speaking to the first king of Essort, the author of a book written 300 years ago. Kane began to panic, thinking he was talking to a ghost, but Yuya reassured him that he was very much alive. He even offered Kane the chance to check his status to confirm. When Kane did, he discovered that Yuya was the god of creation. Yuya noticed Kane's confusion and explained that he had created the world they were in, making him a god. He also revealed that the seven gods had tasked him with training Kane, but Kane insisted that he didn't need more training. Yuya challenged Kane to take the cookie he was holding to prove his strength, but when Kane reached for it, Yuya moved it out of reach and placed his sword at Kane's neck. Kane asked why he needed to become stronger, and Yuya explained that Kane would need to fight someone named Aaron. Although Aaron had been sealed for 300 years the seal was weakening, and he would soon be free. Kane asked why Yuya couldn't just seal Aaron himself but Yuya explained that, as a god he could no longer interfere with the world. He then teleported Kane to a beach and handed him a sword, telling him he needed to find his way back to the cottage by passing through a forest. The catch. He had to reach level 600 to do so which was a challenge since Kane was only at level 300. Yuya also warned Kane that he wasn't allowed to use teleportation before leaving him alone. With no other option, Kane charged into the forest, fighting off monsters that attacked him, much like Captain Levi slayed Titans. Meanwhile back in the Esort Kingdom Sylvia rushed to open the door, hoping Kane had returned home. Instead she found Tessa and Silk, who had come looking for Kane since they hadn't seen him at school. Sylvia told them that he hadn't come home since the previous day and admitted that she was worried something bad had happened to him. Tessa reassured her believing Kane would return, 
and suggested that she and Silk stay at Kane's home until he did. Back in Yuya's world, months had passed and Kane was physically weak, but he managed to slay the monster attacking him. As he lay on the ground, exhausted he heard a sound and went to investigate. He found an injured fox-like creature and decided to end its suffering. However before he could he had a flashback to the night he died on Earth, remembering his vow to help those in need. He scooped up the animal, and used the last of his strength to heal it. This effort caused him to lose consciousness, but when he woke up he found that the fox had been protecting him. Cain decided to keep the creature, naming it Haku, since they were both alone. For the next four years, Haku became his loyal companion like Robin to his Batman. When they finally made it back to Yuya's cottage, Cain was relieved. Yuya welcomed him back and noticing Haku, informed Cain that Haku was a Fenera, a holy beast. He also told Cain that he could form a contract with Haku if he wished, and Cain did so. After forming the contract, Yuya told Cain that his training would continue under an elf named Dur. Cain accepted his new master but asked Yuya tell him more about Eren. Yuya promised to do so before he left. Later Dur took Cain to a mountain pass for training and explained that Eren was stronger than Yuya, who was stronger than him. If Cain wanted a chance to defeat Eren, he would have to defeat Dur first. Cain attempted to attack Dur, but Dur easily dodged and knocked him out with a single punch. When Cain woke up later in the day he found himself in an unfamiliar room, but Haku, his fox companion, was eagerly waiting by his side. Eventually they made their way downstairs, where Cain met Ruri, Durin's wife, along with their pet dragon, whom Haku seemed to be jealous of. Ruri served them dinner, and as Cain devoured the food he couldn't help but cry, as it had been a long time since he had eaten a good meal. The next day Cain began his training with Durin, but defeating him was no easy task. A year quickly passed and Cain still struggled to beat Durin. However when he recalled his conversation with Yuya about Eren, the former god of entertainment who had gone mad with power and used an oracle to control people into committing atrocities, Cain renewed his efforts in the fight. Meanwhile Yuya who had been watching apologized to Cain, revealing that he had been unable to protect Cain's parents. It was then revealed that Cain's parents had been summoned to a sword along with Yuya by the gods, who had begged them to help fight Eren to save the world. Sadly Cain's parents lost their lives in the final battle against Eren. Fueled by the determination to protect his loved ones, Cain finally defeated Durin. Afterward he rushed to Yuya's cottage to see his parents. Kneeling before their graves, Cain thanked Yuya for taking care of them, and vowed to defeat Eren. Before Cain left, Yuya restored his body to its original state, and asked him to take Haku with him. At that moment Durin appeared at the door and insisted that Cain take his pet dragon along as well. Cain expressed his gratitude to both men for looking after him and said his final goodbyes. Before he left, Yuya handed him a sword to deliver to the king. Back at Cain's mansion, the knights were about to start searching for him when Sylvia spotted him walking in. Overcome with emotion, she burst into tears and ran to hug him, joined by Silk and Testia, who welcomed him back with cookies. Cain apologized for making them worry, and eagerly began devouring the cookies, as if he hadn't eaten in days. The next day Cain went to see the king, presenting him with a letter from Yuya and the sword she had given him. He also recounted his rigorous training in Yuya's world and accidentally let it slip that it had taken him five years to complete. The king was astonished but Duke Santana merely laughed, mentioning that the guild had sent a note saying Cain needed to report for a quest soon, or his promotion would be cancelled. Later that day Cain visited the guild master, who informed him that part of his promotion to a rank involved capturing some bandits. These bandits had been attacking travelers on their way to the capital, and Cain was tasked with dealing with them. He left immediately after the briefing and eventually found the bandits, who were already facing off against Millie and Nina. Both girls were surprised to see him, and when Kane noticed that Millie was hurt, he quickly healed her, and assured her that he would handle the situation. The bandits mocked Kane, but he ignored their taunts and easily defeated them without even unsheathing his sword. Once the bandits were tied up, the girls and the man they were escorting thanked Kane for saving them. When the girls asked why he was on the road, Cain explained that he had been given the quest by the guild. Millie pointed out that such quests were usually assigned to those of C rank or higher, so Cain proudly showed them his gold card, revealing his recent promotion. The revelation shocked the girls. The man then asked what they should do with the bandits and Cain told him to leave it to him. In the end, Cain transported the bandits through the city in a cage wagon. When they reached the man's home Cain discovered that he was Parma's father. Parma was surprised to see Cain, and her father explained that Cain had saved them from the bandits. Parma then expressed her admiration for Cain, 
impressed that he was working so hard even on their day off from school. When Parma called Kane a baron, Millie and Nina were shocked. While Millie tried to apologize for speaking rudely to him earlier, Nina concluded that Kane was the perfect match for any gold digger. Kane reassured Millie that nothing had changed between them, and they were still his masters. Overwhelmed with excitement, Millie hugged him, but Kane quickly freed himself and made his way back to the guild. Millie and Nina followed him since they needed to report back to the guild as well. At the guild, Kane informed Risha that he had completed his quest. Just as she was about to inform the guild master, Kane noticed Millie and Nina being harassed by some familiar faces. It turned out that these were the same troublemakers who had tried to harass them years ago. The girls politely asked them to leave, but the leader ignored them and tried to grab Millie's shoulder. Kane swiftly intervened, grabbing the man's hand before he could touch her. The thug, recognizing Kane as the same boy who had beaten them up years ago, panicked and backed away. As Kane glared at them with a murderous look, Claude arrived, causing the thugs to flee in terror. Kane excitedly greeted Claude, who jokingly asked why he had been bullying those guys. Kane explained that they had been harassing his friends, and when Claude noticed the girls he was surprised to see that they knew each other. Kane asked how they were acquainted, and Millie revealed that Claude was her older brother. After Millie explained that Kane had been their student, Claude insisted they all have a drink together, even though it earned him a playful knock on the head from his wife. While they were drinking, Millie shared the story of how they had reunited with Kane after a long time and mentioned that Kane was now a rank. Claude was shocked but not surprised as Kane had been the only student to match him during the entrance exam. Nina also mentioned that Kane was a baron, which surprised Lena and Claude who hadn't known. When Millie asked how Kane had become so strong, Kane struggled to explain his recent adventure. However, Millie wasn't too surprised, noting that Kane had already slain powerful monsters to create magic bags for them. Lena asked Kane how much the magic bags could hold, and while Millie admitted she had no idea, she turned to Kane for the answer. He promised to make one for her, but after she passed out from excitement, Kane remembered he had school the next day and excused himself. After he left, Claude noticed Rishia searching for someone, so he asked if she needed help. Rishia explained that she needed an adventurer to teach a class at the school the next day, which piqued Claude's interest. The next day at school, Kane was eager to show off the skills he had learned from Yuya, but his excitement was crushed when the teacher informed him that he wasn't allowed to cast offensive magic inside the school due to his incredibly high magic levels, which could potentially destroy the building. Unbeknownst to Kane, Claude, Lena, Millie and Nina were all watching and decided to do something to lift his spirits. Later, during their adventure class, the teacher introduced Claude and the others as the guest instructors for the day. Claude then instructed the students to bring out their guild cards. Kane, however, refused to show his, knowing that if his classmates saw that his card was gold rather than bronze like theirs, they would distance themselves from him. He told Claude that he had left it at home, and Claude believed him but warned him not to forget it again. Eventually the class moved outside, and the students took turns sparring with Claude. When Kane finally got his turn his classmates forced him to the back of the line, and just as he was about to spar the bell rang signaling the end of class. Desperate, Kane begged the teacher to let him spar with Claude, but the teacher refused, explaining that they had another class to attend. Claude assured Kane that he would get a chance next time, but the teacher interrupted, saying there wouldn't be a chance next time due to the expense of hiring adventurers, especially after the school had spent money repairing the wall Kane had destroyed. That night, frustrated and needing to blow off some steam, Kane went on a rampage in the forest near his hometown. However, the guard on duty mistook the destruction for the work of a devil, and immediately alerted Garm, who set off with his soldiers to investigate. By the time they arrived, Kane had already teleported out of the forest, leaving behind a massive crater as the only evidence of his outburst. The next day, the king summoned Kane to discuss the incident in the forest. When Kane told him that the gods hadn't mentioned anything about it, the royal advisor suggested allying with other countries to fend off the potential threat. However, Kane advised against it, prompting the king to demand that he reveal everything he knew. Kane reluctantly confessed, while elsewhere in the destroyed forest, a goblin discovered a purple gem, only to be swallowed by a dragon. It was clear that the dragon was being controlled by Aaron, whose power was slowly breaking free from its seal. The following day at school, Kane's class was informed that they would be performing summoning magic, and the teacher introduced a mage from the palace named Grat. Grat explained the process and handed out magic seals to the students, instructing them that if their magic was strong enough, they could form a contract with the creature they summoned. Kane was excited, having already formed contracts with Haku and Jin. 
However, when his turn came, he grew anxious, worried that he might summon something dangerous. Grad encouraged him to channel his magic into the seal, and when he did, there was a powerful burst of energy that pushed him back. As the dust settled, Kane saw a demon sitting before him who introduced himself as the Prince of Darkness. Acting quickly, Kane created a blinding light to prevent his classmates and Grat from seeing the demon. The Prince of Darkness then approached Kane, who drew his sword to strike, only to be surprised when the demon bowed before him, offering to form a contract. The demon, named Seth, even promised to destroy the world for Kane, though Kane declined the offer and agreed to form a contract on his own terms. After Seth vanished, Grat asked Kane if his summoning had been successful, but Kane lied, saying it hadn't. Later that day, the king summoned Kane once again after Grat reported the summoning. Kane confessed that he had summoned the Prince of Darkness and formed a contract with him, shocking everyone present. The king pointed out that Seth could have easily leveled the capital if he had gone on a rampage. He then asked Kane to show them his status, warning Grat not to reveal what he was about to see. When Kane opened his status, it boldly declared that he was a demigod, leaving everyone stunned. The king then announced that he would call an audience and decided to make Kane a viscount assigning him a town near the capital to manage, giving Kane no choice in the matter. Later that day Sylvia tried to convince Kane to throw a small party to celebrate his new position when Colin arrived with urgent news. The forest near Kane's hometown was about to have an outbreak. When Kane arrived his elder brother Digon informed him that the monsters in the forest had become more aggressive, making it difficult for adventurers to enter and exit safely. Digon explained that the behavior of the monsters was eerily similar to how they had acted years ago when they attacked the city. Kane assured his brother that he would investigate, and Digon thanked him for his help. After leaving home, Kane went to the guild to guild to gather information about the forest. While Rudy was sharing what she knew, Millie and Nina arrived. When they saw Kane, they told him that it was impossible to enter the forest because of the monsters. Kane, however, was determined to go, and he assured them that he would go alone. When he arrived at the forest he summoned Haku and Jin, and together, they began exploring the forest, taking down any monsters that dared to attack them. Ain couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching him, so he summoned Seth for help. Seth looked around and said there was a strong presence in the forest, controlling powerful monsters. Ain asked if Seth could find out more, so Seth summoned another demon, Alfred Pennyworth, to scout the area. As they began their search, more monsters attacked. Kane fought them off and then asked Seth and Alfred to keep scouting while he went back to the city. When Millie and Nina saw the powerful monsters Kane had captured, they were amazed. Claude and Lena arrived soon after, and Kane explained that these were the types of monsters causing trouble in the forest. Back in the forest, Seth and Alfred found Aaron's hideout. Aaron, however, ordered the monsters to attack the city. Seth quickly went to find Kane at the guild. Kane felt the danger before the guards even announced it. Seth told him what was happening, so Kane asked Rudy to inform his brother about the situation while he got others ready to deal with the monsters. He headed towards the forest but ran into Tijuana, who wanted to come along. Kane told her to stay in the city and help out while he and Seth continued to the forest. Arriving in the forest, Kane and Seth joined Dala in fighting off the monsters. Kane told Seth and Dala to slow down the monsters while he went ahead to face Aaron. Back in the city Iwana was helping people, and Millie decided to go help Kane with Nina, Claude and Lena agreeing to join her. In the forest, Seth called for his generals to help hold off the monsters. Kane finally reached Aaron and tried to convince him to stop the attacks. Aaron, amused, said he was just seeing how long humans could last before the monsters overwhelmed them. He also mentioned that Kane's eyes reminded him of those who had sealed him away Kane's parents. When Kane confirmed this, Aaron attacked, but Kane dodged. Realizing he couldn't afford to be hit, Kane summoned Haku and Jin for help, but Aaron quickly swatted them aside and started using fire attacks. Just as Claude and the others were struggling, Tijuana arrived with reinforcements and helped them out. Kane couldn't stand seeing Haku and Jin get hurt, so he positioned himself between them and Aaron's attack. Aaron called Kane a fool for risking his life, but Kane said he only wanted to protect his friends. With newfound strength, Kane unleashed a powerful blast that struck Aaron hard. The blast was so big that everyone saw it. didn't stop until Seth and Dala confirmed that Aaron was defeated. They scolded him for almost destroying the forest with his blast, but Kane was thrilled with the victory and ran to meet his friends. Later the king scolded Kane for his reckless fight, and was shocked to learn that Seth had helped him. 
Despite this, he held a meeting with the nobles and made Cain a viscount, giving him a town to govern. Tiwana warned Cain that the adventurer guild in his new domain was known for pushing out the lords who came before him. A few days after Cain took over his domain, a soldier reported back to the king about several incidents some adventurers tried to bully Cain on his first day, but ended up needing medical care themselves. Cain also kicked some rude adventurers out of a bar, which led to his arrest because no one knew who he was. He also dealt with some thieves trying to rob a church. The king was most shocked to hear that Cain had built a castle, which was quite an achievement. Thank you for staying till this point in the video unfortunately we have to end it here. If you want to see more comment part 2.